1817, the English surgeon James Parkinson described the first case of shaking palsy, a condition which would later come to be known as Parkinson's disease. It was later discovered that Parkinson's disease is caused by the progressive death of nerve cells in the substantia nigra, a brain region that's responsible for producing the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine plays a vital role in learning, reward motivation, and controlling and coordinating bodily movements. The loss of dopamine-producing nerve cells is, therefore, what results in the tremors, stiffness, and slowness of movement that James Parkinson observed when he first described this condition in 1817. Since then, treatment for Parkinson's has primarily focused on increasing dopamine levels in the brain. This approach, however, only helps to improve symptoms and does not cure the disease nor slow its progress. Moreover, scientists 200 years later still have no idea what precisely causes Parkinson's, meaning that there isn't much that we can do to prevent it. However, James Parkinson may have left us a much needed clue in his 1817 case reports, a clue that we've long since dismissed. In one case report, he describes how one of his patients, an elderly man, complained of terrible constipation in addition to the shaking palsy. Naturally, the surgeon prescribed a course of laxatives, and 10 days later, the elderly man had emptied his bowels. And his shaking palsy symptoms were also mysteriously gone. James Parkinson may have been onto something here, because now we know that a significant number of people with Parkinson's tend to suffer from chronic constipation many years before their Parkinson's symptoms first appear. Something which has led some leading scientists to suggest that the root cause of many neurodegenerative, neurodevelopmental, and mood disorders like Parkinson's, ALS, autism, depression, and anxiety may in fact be the gut, and more precisely, the gut microbiome. So what is the gut microbiome? How can the gut alter an organ as complex, powerful, and far away from it as the human brain? What are the implications for neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental conditions? And why are some scientists so excited about the gut microbiome as a potential line of treatment and prevention? All questions I plan to answer in this video. My name is Hashim and I'm a medical doctor and University of Cambridge graduate. I create weekly videos about the human brain, what you can do with it, and how you can make it work better for you. This is the first video in a three-part series about the gut microbiome, so if you're interested to learn more about this topic, then you know exactly what you need to do. Take action and subscribe, and you may just unlock your action potential. The gut microbiome is a word used to describe all the bacteria, viruses, and fungi that typically live inside the human gut. Additionally, we believe that the gut microbiome only helped us digest our food, keeping our guts happy and our bowel habits regular. This view started changing, however, when we realized that there were actually trillions upon trillions of these microorganisms living inside our guts. So many, in fact, that they far outnumber your body's own cells by a factor of 10 to 1 according to some estimates. These microorganisms also boast as many as 20 million genes combined. That's a huge number, even more so when you realize that us paltry humans only have 20,000 genes in comparison. One neuroscientist working at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, Jane Foster, had a gut feeling about this. Together with her team, Foster performed experiments on two groups of mice in 2006, one which had a perfectly healthy, normal mouse gut microbiome, and the other without any gut bacteria. They discovered that the rats without the gut microbiome were significantly less anxious than their healthy brothers and sisters. What's more is that these mice also had profound changes in a number of receptors in key critical areas of their brains. Jane Foster eventually concluded that the bacteria in the gut were somehow influencing the development of the brain and altering mouse behavior. So she quickly wrote up her findings from the study and submitted the paper for publication and it immediately changed science forever. End of video. No, that's not what happened. Jane Foster's 2006 study was rejected, she rewrote and submitted the paper again, only to be rejected again, and then… again. That's because other scientists didn't accept the findings of the study. At the time, no one could believe that these lowly bacteria in the gut could have such a profound impact on the brain and our behavior. But Jane Foster persevered, and her paper was finally accepted for publication in 2011 after seven failed attempts. Jane Foster, 
If you ever end up watching this, just know that you are an absolute hero. The reason I mention gut feelings is because we've all experienced these gut feelings and we know how powerful these instincts can be, pushing us away or towards certain things. But is there any scientific basis behind these gut feelings? As it happens, besides being the home of trillions upon trillions of bacterial cells, the gut also happens to contain more neurons than anywhere else in the body except for the brain. This essentially creates communication lines between the neurons in the gut that lead up to the brain and the trillions of bacteria living inside the gut. Scientists describe these communication lines as the gut-brain axes, or what I like to call a collection of highways where goods and services are exchanged between the brain and the gut microbiome. One of the most important highways happens to be the vagus nerve, long believed to carry signals from the brain to the gut. It's now becoming increasingly apparent, however, that the vagus nerve may be carrying signals in both directions. And interestingly, people who have had their vagus nerve removed, a procedure which used to be relatively common as a treatment for stomach ulcers back in the 1970s, are significantly less likely to develop Parkinson's. In the next part of this video, we will look at specific examples of how the gut microbiome may be implicated in Parkinson's, ALS and autism. For a two-page PDF document summarizing the key points of this video, make sure to check the description below for a link to that document. Scientists don't really know what causes the dopamine-producing nerve cells and the substantia nigra to die in Parkinson's disease. However, it seems that a misfolded protein, alpha-synuclein, plays a key role. It's believed that the first misfolded alpha-synuclein protein causes others to misfold in a similar way to how amyloid beta proteins misfold in Alzheimer's disease. With Parkinson's, these misfolded alpha-synuclein proteins eventually form Lewy bodies, which are toxic to the nerve cells in the substantia nigra. But the question remained, what triggers the first misfolding event? In 2015, a neurologist at the University of Louisville in Kentucky proposed a new theory. Robert Friedland had read that a particular strain of E. coli had the genes to produce a protein called curly. The protein was incidentally remarkably similar to the misfolded alpha-synuclein. So Friedland wondered if that strain of E. coli could be providing the brain through the vagus nerve with a template to produce the misfolded alpha-synuclein, and hence triggering the first misfolding event and igniting the disease. And sure enough, when Friedman and his team fed healthy mice that particular strain of E. coli, misfolded alpha-synuclein proteins began appearing in the brains of these mice. In 2019, another group of scientists repeated the same experiment and obtained similar results to Friedland's. That group didn't stop there, however, and carried out a second experiment where they removed the vagus nerve before feeding the mice that strain of E. coli. And without the vagus nerve, the mice produced no misfolded proteins, possibly explaining why people who have had their vagus nerve removed back in the 1970s were significantly less likely to develop Parkinson's. But before you go on and wipe out your entire gut microbiome with some good old-fashioned broad-spectrum antibiotics, it's helpful to remember that some of these bacteria can also be very helpful. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, is a fatal progressive neurodegenerative disease. One of its key features is that some ALS patients will deteriorate very rapidly, while others decline much more slowly. In 2019, scientists working in Israel's Weizmann Institute of Science were able to develop a mouse model of ALS. They discovered that when the mice lacked a gut microbiome from birth, they declined much more rapidly. Moreover, they were able to identify two species of bacteria that made the ALS symptoms worse, and one species that made it better. The beneficial species identified was Acromenasia mucinophila. This species of bacteria produces a molecule called nicotinamide, better known as vitamin B3, which can travel in the bloodstream and penetrate through the blood-brain barrier to enter the brain and improve ALS symptoms. Acromenasia and nicotinamide aren't unique in any way. In fact, your gut microbiome produces or modifies at least half of all the small molecules traveling in your bloodstream this very moment. A Swedish study of 1.8 million pregnant women revealed that women hospitalized for any infection during pregnancy were 79% more likely to have a child diagnosed with autism. 
Scientists were able to produce similar results in an animal model and believe that the inflammation caused by the infection results in the mother producing large quantities of interleukin-17, which can then cross the placenta and enter the fetus brain. However, the question remains, why were only some women affected while others were not? According to this 2017 study published in Nature, the answer could be a long gut microbe living in the mother's gut and known to promote significantly more inflammation, resulting in more interleukin-17 production and an elevated risk of the offspring developing autism. Though, if the pregnant mice were treated with an antibiotic to wipe out these long gut microbes before infecting them with the virus, the babies produced showed no signs of autistic-like behavior. And scientists are currently investigating another species of bacterium that may help to treat some of the symptoms of autism, Lactobacillus ruteri. In one experiment, the scientists were able to reverse some of the autism-like behaviors in mice by administering Lactobacillus ruteri, which they had previously found to be missing in the autistic mouse mice's gut microbiome. It's worth noting, however, that only some strains of Lactobacillus ruteri can actually do this, meaning that it's likely that there are specific genes that produce some currently unknown molecule that can enter the brain and reduce autism symptoms. Very possibly through the vagus nerve, as scientists were able to block the effect of Lactobacillus ruteri if they had severed the vagus nerve beforehand. Altogether, the research is very promising and one team in Italy has already moved forwards with human trials. All this, and we've barely just scratched the surface. Our understanding of the gut microbiome is very rudimentary. We know significantly less about the gut microbiome than we know about the human brain. However, it seems to me at least that the gut microbiome is just as complex, if not more so, than the brain. In the gut you have trillions of microorganisms, each with its unique agenda producing a myriad of molecules that affect its host, us in this case, in bizarre and often profound ways. What's more is that all these microorganisms will almost certainly be affected by each other's presence, and also by us and our unique biology. Essentially what I mean to say is, a gut microbiome which keeps me healthy may not necessarily keep you healthy. Still, it's remarkably easier to modify the gut microbiome than it is to modify the brain through the use of antibiotics, probiotics, changing what you eat, and even how much you exercise. We could be heading towards a future where probiotics containing specific strains of bacteria become a standard line of treatment for many neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental conditions. In the next part of this series, we will move on from neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental conditions to look at the gut microbiome's role in mood disorders like depression and anxiety, and why antibiotics can sometimes result in depression through their effects on the gut bacteria. Remember to check the description for a link to a two-page PDF summary of the key points of this video, and head over to Substack to access the references I used in this video. Remember to take action and subscribe, and you may just unlock your action potential.